The Australia Council for the Arts acknowledges the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and pays our respect to the elders, both past and present. Uh, so yes, my name is Sean Callanan um, and I'm from Chunky Media. Um, and then when I started talking to Celia about uh, the conference and, and the brief that she was looking for, and she did say she was trying to get a panel of all the, of all the different networks, um, they, don't play well, they don't play well together. So it would have been a really combative uh, uh, panel. Um, and uh, she initially contacted me about uh, Snapchat and uh, talking about how the arts could market themselves using digital and I thought it was going to be a Snapchat keynote, which I'm happy to do, but I said there's so many other opportunities uh, for, for the arts uh, with, with all the channels that are there. Um, and uh, Celia was introduced to me as uh, Chunky Media. Uh, so Chunky Media is a business that I've formed with a uh, a good fr friend of mine um, who works a lot in the e-commerce space and hospitality space um, and my business, my primary business for the last seven years has been, has been Sports Geek. Uh, so before Sports Geek I was just a regular geek, I was a coder developer uh, for 15 years but I was a frustrated sports fan for what was being delivered to the sports fan when all the opportunities were there. Um, and so what we've done with uh, Chunky Media is to help uh, any business, uh, because it is very hard for me as sports geek to come to, a, to an arts conference, but as Chunky Media I have some opportunities uh, to help any business around gaining traction uh, with their business and, and using, the, using the opportunities and the, and the campaigns and platforms that we've used in sport and with other, with other verticals. So one of the things that we look at, especially in the sports space, and it, and it definitely applies uh, for the arts, is is that, is that digital fan journey and the fact that now we've got all these different platforms that can, can increase that fan journey. So from a sports point of view, you want to get them interested and then you want them to become a member of your club and as a membership manager in the AFL or cricket or, or the NRL, their goal is to get your credit card and you just say, that's okay, you can have it until I die. Right? That's the goal. And so it's the same goal um, in, in other industries where you want to you know, get patrons. And what social is now offered is far more many means to communicate with your fans. You know, seven years ago, you would have got hard mail, like in the letterbox, maybe a couple of emails from whether it be a, a theatre company or a football club or anyone that's trying to communicate. And so over a year, you're getting five or six pieces of communication. Now you can get one or two Facebook posts, a couple of tweets a day, an Instagram post, maybe a Snapchat story once a week. All of these different channels are now available. So you've gone from talking to your customer, to your patron, to your fan, five times a year to thousands. And so the advantage in this room as in compared to if I'm talking at the MCG or down the road at the Adelaide Oval, is that you're natural storytellers. I've, that's been a thing that we've had to try to teach the sports industry, that their storytelling is, is the event itself. But these, all of these channels offer you the ability to tell a story and tell your story and, and drive your fan along. So what I want to do here is, yes, the arts is not the same as, as sport, but there's plenty that you, can, that you can learn from sport. And the thing is, the, the, uh, the example that James gave in the, in the first panel of cricket and the AFL and, and the, you know, the burgeoning resources in the media space, that's only happened in the last 15 years. Um, the, the AFL just turned on their marketing engine 15 years ago. The NRL did it seven years ago. So you can, ca you know, you can catch up to them uh, when, and it, it was all driven by content to the fans and understanding what the fans wanted. What sports does really well is tying the passion that the fans have for the sport to their identity. Right? See the idiot dancing in the middle there? That's me. That's my son next to me and my two brothers. And that was at the AFL Grand Final, if I go back one. That was at the AFL Grand Final in 2010. I'm sitting there with my two brothers and my son, um, and then my phone just starts going bananas. Tweets are coming in left, right and centre. That was on the Channel 7 coverage of the AFL Grand Final. 
And the funny thing was, I was working with Collingwood at the time, and people thought that somehow I had magically tweeted to the cameraman to get us on the shot. I didn't tell them I didn't. Um, but the funny thing was, it happened during an ad break, so no one in Australia saw it. So the tweets I was getting in were from New York, Delhi in India, and some friends in Portland that saw me on the coverage. Uh, so it's quite, uh, and it just sort of shows from my point of view, the passion identity, that's two generations of Collingwood fans, we're all members, my dad didn't give us a choice, and my great-grandfather actually played for Collingwood in 1910, you know, 100 years ago before that game. So it's some completely tied to them, uh, tied to my identity. And what we've seen in, in uh, the NRL world and in Sydney specifically, because Melbourne is a real membership town, the AFL has done so much work in selling the membership message. Um, I say they're now at guilt level marketing. Right? You meet someone who's an AFL fan and you're a fan and you go, oh, you broke for Collingwood? My second question is, are you a member? They are doing the advertising for them. But that's taken years and years of indoctrinating their fans to say, this is how you best support us. The other thing that they're doing uh, really well is developing FOMO around the live experience. So people know what FOMO means? Fear of missing out, right? Events, as we become more connected, as we stream more stuff and have more options and all of our TV devices, live is becoming more and more premium. Events and the experience is becoming more and more premium. And helping your fans to amplify your live event is the best way to get more fans to figure out why I should be there. Um, when I started Sports Geek, that was a real hard thing to do because you'd get to a big stadium and there would be no Wi-Fi and you couldn't get a message out, right? And that, so that problem is, is going away. So anything you can do to get your fans to be telling them, telling their friends um, what they're doing is advertising for you. So what, the main thing when you're looking at uh, anything digital and a digital strategy point of view is you've got to have goals around what you want to do. And normally they, they, they will come around three main areas. Engagement, data, and content. Okay, I've already heard building audiences a couple of times this morning, right? And that's the second one, data. Understanding the data that you have. And I'm going to go through some ways to find out how much data you do have. Because um, normally when we sit down with a business, people go, oh, we don't have, we've got a bit of a database, oh, we've got some emails, oh, we've got something from ticketing, and it hasn't been consolidated, but there are now opportunities via, via digital and social to really get a better understanding of your data position. Now, you may have seen, uh, who's seen this picture? Okay, no spoilers. Right, so this picture went viral. What a perfect metaphor for our age. All these kids just looking at their phone when there's a Rembrandt behind them. You know, the end of civilization. Oh my God, what a sad picture in our society. These kids can't take in the arts. But there's an app for that. They were all looking at the app that the museum provided and doing the study tour through it. But the internet just likes getting angry. It doesn't want, doesn't want that story. So it does show that you've got to be building experiences for your audience in the way that they do go about consuming them. And those kids do, they do learn via their iPads and their, and their tablets and, and their mobile devices. So I wanted to look at sort of what the landscape's there and what are the opportunities uh, for the arts are. So what's the landscape look like? This is the one where it's just like big scary movie. That's all the different opportunities in the digital marketing space. Advertising and promotion, content and experience, social and relationships, commerce and sales. You can try taking a photo, you will not see all those logos. But if you go to chiefmartech.com, you can get it. But that's today. This is where it's been. This is the last five years. It's gone from 150 partners in the space, 350, 1,000, to now 3,500. So it's very confusing as a marketer when you do get pitched, 
I've got a solution for this. I've got a solution for this. I've got a solution for this. And sometimes it's about keeping it simple. There are a stack of great tools in this space, but you can get tool fatigue and there's just too many options available. So I want to keep it simple with these three. That's the new Instagram logo. Who hates the new Instagram logo? Everyone hates the new Instagram logo. So I want to really focus on Facebook, Instagram, and, and Snapchat in this, in this, for this uh, discussion. I'm happy to talk about others afterwards and take questions, those kind of things. Um, first one is Facebook. Facebook sells. Facebook has the most uh, sophisticated ad product out there right now. Um, as an example, from a, from a sports point of view, uh, we ran all the digital advertising for the Asian Cup uh, last January. Um, and if you're, a, if you're a football fan, you, might have, you, you should have known about the Asian Cup. But if you're like me, as more of an AFL person, oh, I didn't know the Asian Cup was coming to Australia, and neither did most of Australia. Uh, so we had to inform them, and we did, we did that exclusively through Facebook. We did videos to tell people it was coming up, that it was going to be in these cities, that it was going to be affordable. And then when it was ready to sell tickets or the phrase that we use a lot, when it was about getting the cheeks on the seats, right, which is what your business is, you've got to get the cheeks in the seats. Uh, in December, with a spend of $15,000, we got $120,000 worth of ticket sales from those Facebook ads. But it was about the nine months earlier of warming up all the audiences, right? So we're going back to that building audiences. That's what Facebook helps you do really, really well. One in every three minutes on Australian mobiles, Facebook owns. One in every three minutes. Now, Facebook owns Facebook, Facebook owns Instagram, and Facebook also owns WhatsApp. But that's a staggering stack, that one in every t three minutes, people are looking at their phones, they're doing so on a Facebook property. The thing is, Facebook's got all that data as well, right? And as a marketer, it might be as an evil marketer, you go, that's cool. Like, look, they know all this information about what Australians are doing. 15 million of them. It's 15 million Australians that are on Facebook. And Facebook definitely drives traffic. It's the primary source of traffic for all the sports sites that I work with. And so it's a matter of making sure that when you are putting something out, on Facebook is going, what do I want? What do I want? What action do I want? What do I want my, our fans to do? If you want them to drive traffic, then give them your best content. Um, if you don't give your best content and your patrons, your audience, your fans don't like it, Facebook will take note. Facebook will go, that's terrible content. Facebook does not like terrible content. We're not going to let anyone see it. Right? So only give them your best. But it does drive traffic. But the real power of Facebook in that it is connecting the world is it just has so much data, right? And this comes back to, again, that building audiences piece. The first piece of data is custom audiences. So just a quick show of hands. Who's opened up Facebook Business Manager or the ad account and loaded data to see, loaded data into a custom audience? Okay, so a few, that's good. All right, so that's what Facebook allows you to do. Take an email list, ticket buyers, subscribers, members, whatever it is, and say it's 2,000 emails. You, give, you load that into Facebook. It's not like you're handing the emails over to Zuck. It's just he's taking a picture of them and going, yes, I know. And so say of that 2,000 emails, he'll come back and go, yeah, I know 1,500 of them. Do you want to send them? And the whole idea is it's a precursor to selling an ad. He wants you then to advertise to them. But the first thing is you've just got the data. You can now look at that data and go, oh, so what do my patrons and my members, what do they like? What do last year's ticket buyers like the most? And you can dive into Facebook's data and just get that analysis. What other, what other events do they go to? It's all there. So the first thing, even without spending any money with Facebook, Load up the audiences just to see what your, just to see what your people and what your data says about your audience. 
it can bust some myths really quickly. If you go, oh, no, our, uh, our demographic is 35 to 45 and it's definitely that, and then you load the data and go, oh, hang on, no, Facebook says it's a different demographic. It can completely change your marketing plans. So that's the first one, custom audiences and, and loading them up and, and intersecting them with the data that Facebook has. And the second one is website pixels. So who has a Facebook website pixel on their website? Okay, it's good. So a Facebook pixel is, in its raw terms, is a remarketing pixel. Um, but what it does is, I so say then the next question is, when was the last time you logged out of Facebook? Never. Right? So when you don't log out of Facebook and you put a pixel on a website, Facebook knows that you've been there. So you've ever gone and booked a, tried to book a holiday to Bali and then you go back to Facebook and goes, hey, do you want a Bali holiday? You want a Bali holiday? That's remarketing, right? That's remarketing 101. You can do it on Google, you can do it on, on Facebook. Um, but what the website pixel will do for you is it starts collecting another audience. So if you're going to run an ad for your event, your play, your theatre company, whatever it is, and you want to say, I want to target everybody in Adelaide, that's a lot of people. You're going to waste a lot of money. What if you just said, I want to target everybody in Adelaide who's visited our site in the last six months? That's going to, they're going to be hot prospects. They've already checked you out. They've already checked out the, the, the event, or they've even checked out a specific part of, the, of your website. That's, again, that's the power of your website pixel that you can start building out this audience to say, oh, these are potential customers, potential fans, potential patrons. And then you can do things like, oh, well, what about people who visit our website that don't yet like our page? Maybe we should be sending them some information to then start liking our page a bit more and getting engaged. So that all happens in the Facebook Business Manager. So Business Manager is Facebook's version of... Um, I call it Facebook big boy pants. Um, but it allows it, a business to be operating in, in, the, in, the, in the Facebook world around the advertising and management of pages. And so when you go into the audience section, you have three and sometimes four, depending on what it is. They've just come out with some new s options. You can create a customer list, right? So to begin with, load as much data in there as possible. And keep it, all diff keep it all separate. Oh, here's our ticket buyers. Here's our members. Here's our donors. Here's people who have signed over to our email list. Put them all in, a different, all in different lists. Because then you can still you can merge them together and say, what does our whole data picture look like? Where do they live? What's their age demographic? What devices are they using? What other, what other uh, events are they attending? Uh, and then the other one is install the website pixel. If for nothing else, just to grow an audience. So when you go, oh, okay, we've got all these people now, they're collecting this audience, oh, now we're going out with our production. Fire out an ad to those people first, because they've checked out your site. Um, and it starts giving you more information of people who are checking out your site. And then you can start diving into the audience insights. Right, so I just asked Facebook, I said, Facebook, tell me people who are interested in theatre, plays, performance, art. Facebook said, 3.2 million people in Australia. And that's the age breakup. Now, it might not be exactly what you think it is, but that's what Facebook thinks it is. So that's, a, again, another opportunity that you could potentially build out audiences to say, well, I think these people might be interested in my art or my performance. So from a, from a paid point of view, Facebook's pretty clear in what you're looking for. And it's in these three pillars. Do you want awareness for your, for your business or your event? All right, so the one that you could use a lot, is it, this, no, it doesn't have a pointer. Uh, reach people near your business. So what Facebook allows you to do, let's say, let's say the wine centre as an example. We can drop a pin right here we can say, anyone within one mile, we're going to tell them there's an event at the wine centre next Friday. And we can say, oh, I just want to target people who like wine. I'm going to tell them um, from 5 o'clock till 7 o'clock when they're leaving work and they might be near the CBD so they know there's an event coming on. 
right? So that's a local awareness ad. There's a, an opportunity where you can let more people know about it. Do you want consideration? Do you want people to engage with what you're doing? Right, so you can be sending people to your website, driving web traffic, uh, getting video views, which is super powerful, and I'll go through that in a minute. Um, and then the last one is conversion. Do you actually want to make a sale? Right, and so that's what we did with the, with the Asian Cup. So the Asian Cup was, early on, it was awareness. It was in, and then it was engagement. We put out a lot of posts that engaged the football audience to say, yeah, I'm really excited, because we knew they were going to be really excited. And then I, as a non-football person, saw my football mates liking the content. So that's how I got interested in it. And then once, they saw, once I saw that I've gone and visited the website, I will show, them a vi I'll show me a video. And so then I'm more interested. And then when we came to the got to sell a ticket, three or four weeks out, we ran conversion campaigns. And the beauty of the conversion campaigns, when it's all set up and you get your, you get your digital plumbing right, is you can say, Facebook, can you please send this ad to people who end up buying tickets? Right? You put a pixel at the, at the checkout spot and Facebook goes, so you want me to target more people like that? You go, yeah, just keep optimizing it for that. So you can target a wider audience right, and say 50,000 people. And then Facebook starts seeing that 34-year-old women are the ones buying tickets. Facebook will serve that ad to more 34-year-old women. Right? So, and it's doing it automatically for you. It's not like you've got to go check the results and go change the campaign and do all of that. It's doing it automatically. So the, so the campaigns that we've had the most success with in the ticketing space um, are these three. So video views, right? If you've opened up Facebook in the last 12 months, you can't escape video, right? Mark Zuckerberg's pretty much put YouTube in the crosshairs chasing it down, right? Every time you open up Facebook, there's, there's video views. The thing you've got to take note of from a social point of view is when someone, when a platform, especially Facebook, starts saying, oh, we're really concentrating on video, as a marketer, get on it. Because the sooner you're on it, the cheaper you'll get it. So at the moment, we're getting, uh, again, if you're targeting the right people, we're getting video views in the tenths of cents. But that's not the best bit. The best bit is Facebook knows you're looking to build an audience. So when you run a video views campaign, Facebook will give you two audiences as an outcome of that, event, of that campaign. People who saw the video and people who watched the video to completion. Okay, so again, if it's an appropriate video, don't make it a 45 minute video. Don't even make it a 90 second video. If it's between 15 and 30 seconds, it's a good, you know, again, think of your own experience. It's got a one, stop the thumb. It's got a one, they've got to, do they have to turn on sound, right? How many times do you just watch it and not turn on the sound, right? So make sure that your video makes sense in that space. Now, obviously, if it's someone singing and it's all about that, then you're going to have audio, but remember, a lot of people won't. Um, and if you keep it short enough, if someone watches to the end, right, then the good thing is they can click the button and find out more, but you can then mark it back to those people. Well, we know you saw the video, or we know you saw this video and this video. We're ready to see your ticket. Buy a ticket. Um, post engagement uh, is, a, is a really good one to engage your fans, your key fans that you know love you, and they're going to amplify what you do. So we always put a little bit of budget into that space to uh, keep those fans happy and making sure that your content is getting in their feed. Okay, because Facebook does have... Uh, this algorithm called the Edge Rank. Uh, so who's heard of Edge Rank? So Facebook, Facebook deliberately um, decides what you see in your new feed, news feed. Because overall, we all like too, too much stuff. On average, we like 1,500 things. There's no way known you can consume the content from 1,500 things. So Facebook's Edge Rank makes sure that you keep seeing the content you're engaging with. So as a page owner, you need to make sure that you've got content that your fans will engage with every now and again so they'll keep seeing your content. Right? It's very easy in the sports sense, and it's a hack that we learned really early on, 
before, two hours before a game, a sports fan is at their most positive. And we just put out a post going, do you think we're going to win? And the fan can't help but hit like. Right? They can, you know, and it almost becomes superstitious. No, oh, we didn't win. Oh, I didn't hit like. <laughs> right? So try to figure out that little hack for you that, 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 that hits the mark for your key fan. Uh, and then the last one is obviously web, web conversion. And then from an audience point of view, at its broad level, you know, Facebook fans is an audience, your web visitors is an audience, and then the data audiences you just went and built. Right? That's your starting point. Because you've got a lot of that data uh, to begin with. And so, since talking to Celia, I was looking at different examples, and this one came out last week or 10 days ago, I think, with all the press around the new Harry Potter play. Look at the number down the bottom, 94,000 people talking about it. What they did really well is, one, they pushed a lot of the content out and just let it be, let it be shared. Right? And so obviously all the, all the pictures were picked up by a PR point of view, but then it started to drive people back to the, to the Facebook page, and that might be the only place that they consume this content. They might not actually go to the website. They, just might, they might just share and say, oh my God, have you seen Hermione? She's now black. <laughs> right? And so they pushed all that content out with all the photos and stuff like that, but for me... The key piece is looking at what they're doing from the video's point of view. Let's see if this works. You've been amazing for years at keeping Harry Potter secret so you didn't spoil the books for readers who came after you. So I'm asking you one more time to keep the secrets and let audiences enjoy Cursed Child with all the surprises that we've built into the story. Thank you. So the number that impresses me is the quarter of a million views of that video. Right? So if they've, if they've and I suggest that they most likely have, if they're running a video views campaign, not to Australia, but if they're running that into London, they've now got an audience now, it is a very targetable, easy-to-find audience. It's like, how do we target Harry Potter fans? I wonder. Right? <laughs> but, but they can at least go, if you've watched all of, that, all of that video and you're in London, you're really likely to want to buy a ticket. Again, they're probably not going to have trouble selling tickets. But the idea is you can build up all these audiences off these assets. So if you take anything away, if you take one thing away from this, is get that video piece right. If you can get that video piece right for your productions and your events and, and that kind of thing and push that out, it can be very, very cost effective. Um, so uh, to use an example, and, and the thing is, and it's because Facebook is pushing video. So it's pushing video in this form and it's also pushing live video. Um, and as an example, I did a, uh, I did a Facebook Live Q&A on my page, which has 300 likes. And I said, I'm going to do a Q&A, talk about anything sport or digital or technology, I'm just going to test out this, this stuff, I had my phone there. Um, I then shared it on the Sports Geek page, which has about 4,000 likes. Um, and I spoke for about 40 minutes, just answering questions from people. And then I took $60 and I promoted it to a sports business interested audience that I'd already built out. For $60, I got 12,000 uh, 12, people reached um, and another 6,000 views, uh, no, 2,000 views of the video overall. And I've got a little audience there of 2,000 people who saw a segment of that video that I can use later in a following campaign for $60. Um, so it's, it's something that they're pushing really hard. And the thing is, if you see something that is you know, you put out a video and it is going viral and it is going really, really well, don't sit on your hands, put money behind it. Because Facebook will give you more reach, more organic fans and give it to you cheaper when it's popular because they want popular stuff. So the guys of the Golden State Warriors who are currently in the NBA Finals, every time they have a really good highlight video, they promote it for like $50 to get more and more fans. 
and they get organic fans, they get free fans effectively from it as well. But the main thing is they're building out audiences to sell tickets or merchandise too. So that's a powerful piece that that video can offer. And I can't, you know, I can't stress enough um, how powerful video or how much Facebook is putting into video at the minute. From a, from a pure engagement point of view and a, and a content piece from a Facebook point of view, it pretty much looking for uh, four things and some of the things that we, we look at. And this list has changed, you know, over the last uh, seven years, definitely. Um, Facebook is pushing video so much now. If you want engagement and likes and uh, uh, anything, put it in video form, right? You're even seeing some, uh, some pages putting up like animated, uh, animated pictures but in a video form, right? Because they, they know Facebook wants video, so give it a three-second video. Um, you know, not to go back to Harry Potter, but like effectively like the moving pictures, you know, with the eyes moving around. Um, there's a few pages that are doing that or like short snippets. If you want to drive traffic, share a, share a link, right? Um, if you want to know what Facebook is doing, just pretty much listen to what Mark Zuckerberg says at the conferences because he pretty much just lays it out for people. Two years ago, he said, I want Facebook to be the newspaper of the world. And so that, that changed the whole trend from, and you all probably did it, probably four years ago, you were doing big pictures with little bitly links, right? And saying, hey, here's, here's our latest production. Click here to find out more. Right? And we were doing it in the sports space as well because it was good, it was engaging, people would like a photo. Um, but when they made the change, oh, you want traffic? Do it as a link. So you push in the link and then you get the nice big picture and the nice subheading and the nice little pull through text, which you can edit all of those things. If you want traffic, that's what Facebook expects you to post. Um, pictures are still very good from an engagement point of view. If you just want to do that pure engagement piece of likes and shares, they're going to get shared more than a link. Uh, and the last one, again, is sort of more of being a recent tweak. Early on, we could always use a question to hack our way to a like. Like I said before, do you think we're going to win? Question. Right? And the stats show when you finish your status with a question, you got more likes. Um, Facebook has since tweaked that. If you, write, if you keep writing questions and no one responds, Facebook goes, they must be terrible questions. No one likes your questions. So use them sparingly. Because um, they are pulling in all the factors that go, well, yes, you are an engaging page. We're going to reward that with more organic growth. So one of the things that sports have done very well is embracing the, what I call the digital cheer squad. Like I use the analogy of the MCG or, or the Adelaide Oval where there is an actual physical cheer squad that can do the cheers that fill the whole stadium. That happens online. You only need, again, that small group to be really loud. And again, as a conference organiser, Celia would know, you get 20 people tweeting in the room and everyone goes, oh, gee, the, uh, gee, the hubbub around, around the event is great. You need to embrace your, your digital cheer squad. Who knows who this is? It is. It's Putty from Seinfeld. Putty is the epitome of the 90s fan, and in this case, the sports fan. To show, to show you were a sports fan, you had to actually physically paint your face. We're the devils! The devils! Whereas now, digital is the face paint, right? You don't actually have to have the physical appearance to say, I'm a Collingwood fan, or I'm a fan of the arts, or I'm a fan of whatever, because you're doing it via digital means, right? You are showing the world what kind of fan you are by what you're Instagramming, what you're snapping, what you're liking on Facebook, what you're sharing, what you're talking about, and that you're showing the whole world that you're a, you're a fan, so it's really important to understand the different types of fans. And the reason I love this, this infograph is because it, it sort of dispels a, a few myths. Like if a current affair were here and they said, social media fans, 
They're those megaphones that tell you that it's raining and they've just had uh, breakfast and uh, they're going for a walk now and their Fitbit says this, right? That's only a small portion of fans. And what we've found in, in the sports space, and I think it is completely applicable in the art space, is, is that inner circle, right? You want to feel like you're part of the company, part of the production, but behind the scenes, behind the curtain, see what's happening. That's exactly what sports fans want. And so there's that inner circle space, that you, that's the content that they want. But what we've also found is depending on the different types of content, this, people can change personas, right? Someone might be cautious, a, lo- a lurker, just sitting there reading stuff. You know, 40% of people, 40% of people on Twitter don't tweet. So they're just reading stuff. So they're in that info seeker, cautious space. But if you can go and push out a piece of content that they love, that hits them right where they, you know, their passion point, they will go from cautious or info seeker or inner circle to megaphone, right? They'll go to real key amplifier. So it's a matter of listening and seeing what pieces of your content really just go pow, you know, go bananas and so we go, oh, hang on, we've, we've really scratched an itch there. How can we produce more content in that space? But it's, but, you've, but it's really important to know that you're serving all of these different fans, you know. Business First is probably sitting there, they're on LinkedIn and they're, you know, they're all about the job, but, you know, if you put, put, put out a specific piece of content that fits for them, then that's how they'll consume it. So have those different... Um, Con, uh, audiences that you know that you're trying to serve. So Instagram is, my, is what I'm going to talk about uh, second um, because it is very much a platform that I th- that fits for your space perfectly. Um, and, face- and Instagram is different to Facebook. Um, Facebook is where you you know you connect with your friends, uh, you follow you follow brands that you like, and you stalk the people you went to high school with. Um, whereas Instagram, you follow your six passions. And the arts definitely fits, you know, I can tell from this room, the arts fits in those passions, right? So you've got to figure out how you fit into that space and make sure you're serving that, that audience. So that can be by understanding, you know, the hashtags and things that are, that, that are available. Um, I did hear uh, if this, then that spoken, but does, any, does anyone use if, if, if this, then that, a few. If this, then that is awesome, right? And so, what if this, then that does, and it you know goes to my inner geek, it connects the pipes of the internet. And so, you can do things like save all your Instagram likes to Dropbox. Why would you want to do that? Well, don't you want to know what? Photos are being shared around your venue on your hashtag. Don't you want to have some sort of metric to say, hey, look at that. Every time people are coming, they're taking a shot in the foyer before they're going in or they're celebrating because they're bragging. You want to amplify that. So the first thing is, as an account holder, you want to double tap all your, all your patrons' photos because it qualifies the behaviour. It's like, yes, more of those, please. And the good thing about this, then it saves it all for you. So you've automatically got a metric. When I'm working with my uh, digital staff, I say, so how many, how many likes have you done this month? You don't have to do it straight away. It can be once a week, you just go through, tap, 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 tap. And it starts, starts recording them. And then you can end up with activations like this at the, at the Australian Open, where they pulled in all the Instagrams and made a uh, mosaic of, of the players. So the last one I want to discuss is Snapchat. Because uh, it is the new player in the room, uh, on the uh, in the in the industry, and it's innovating at a breakneck speed. Um, so quickly, just show of hands, who's on Snapchat? Okay, it's good. It's, it's more than I thought. And at every time I'm doing these, but it, it is growing. It's become for mine. It's becoming more mainstream. Um, to me, Snapchat, it's the ultimate storytelling platform from a social media point of view. And again, this is, this is the opportunity for you in the room because you are natural storytellers. 
So for people who don't, you know, don't know, don't get um, Snapchat and the storytelling element, and that was the pivot for Snapchat for mine. Early on, it was just a photo messaging service primarily, and it might have got uh, stuck with nude pics and things like that and got smeared in the media under that sense. Um, but their pivot about two and a half years ago was to introduce the Snapchat story, which allows you to put multiple pictures into a story and your followers can watch it. It's the only social platform that shows a story in chronological order, as, as all stories have done since the beginning of time, right? Or every other social media platform is backwards. You log on to Twitter and you get the latest, then you go back through the feed. Same with Facebook, um, same with Instagram. So when people say, oh, how do I, I don't, don't get it as a storytelling platform, I say, imagine if Ferris Bueller had Snapchat. That would be an epic Snapchat story. Right? And so you need to figure out how you can tell an epic story around, um, around your events. But how do you go about Snapchatting without... Uh, how do you go about Snapchat without Snapchatting? The other option uh, is via geofilters. And so there's two types of geofilters available with Snapchat. There's community ones where you can get them installed on uh, la uh, specific landmarks. And then you can get on-demand ones for, for events and those kind of things. So quick check, has anyone, got a, a has anyone successfully submitted a community geofilter? No? So there's every chance if you are from a venue um, or a theatre or something like that, um, I would attempt that to begin with because it's free. So if you're pulling out Snapchat right now, there's about three or four for Adelaide, right? But you can have them targeted for, um, for a particular venue. But the opportunities, and it is pretty straightforward. Tell your graphics designer, here's what I want, a little bit of this. But the big value for mine is in the on-demand uh, Snapchats, right? And you simply go to geofilters.snapchat.com, upload a photo, upload a filter, Sean Callan on stage. You go to the map, you draw some lines around the map, you tell the map when I want to when I want to run the the filter. From 11 o'clock to 2 p.m., the wine centre today. Look at the cost. So for five dollars, for three hours. You can take a Snapchat and you'll have my branded Snapchat on your snaps. So, again, I saw there was one of the workshops marketing on a shoestring. $5 is a pretty good, is pretty good value to put it in your lobby for every single Friday night to say and have a spot that says, don't forget, send a snap. And they go and snap and they see the play. If you're opening up Snapchat now, you'll see my Snapchat. You'll also see... Uh, Village Roadshow are doing uh, The Conjuring 2, right? The movie, uh, and that's a, na that's a nationwide uh, Snapchat. So they would have paid a little bit more than $5. But you don't need nationwide. You can just do it around your events. One of the last ones I wanted to uh, include, and I was speaking to Rick uh, yesterday, who's used or funded something via Possible? Right, they are smashing the art space. Um, Rick gave me an update. $50 million has been pledged in the creative space through the Possible platform. Now, though, as an opportunity, massive opportunity, but it's very much backed by data. Like, you need to be able to push out your message to your fans to get something backed. But I think it's something you want to... If you haven't looked at Possible or investigated it around... around um, Running it, there's a stack of uh, events in the creative space. Uh, for us, what we've worked on the past seven years in Sports Geek and what we're looking at now uh, with all things chunky is seeing where digital, digital can deliver. So it starts off, how many more people can we reach? So whether it's the Asian Cup and telling more people about the Asian Cup via some videos of Timmy Cowell, or it's, you know, Harry Potter, new Harry Potter play, it's about reach. So that's where you push the video out as wide as possible. It's your qualifier, right? And then it's about engaging. Like, no one wants to be sold to the first time. Engage them. 
So it becomes multifaceted. It becomes a little bit more sophisticated. They're going to get a video. They're going to get some pictures of the cast, or they're going to get some uh, another video from the director talking about why they're doing it. Or you're going to, you know, we're going to pitch our story that gets them back to the website. And so they've been on the website, so now we're building up that audience. So that becomes understated. Um, and again, I think there's another workshop. It's like, holy hell, we need we need tickets. Do it, do it now. Like that can be done, but it's far easier to do it if you've done that reach and engage piece first, because then you want to convert them. And so the conversion can happen in, in can be more than just a dollar ticketing conversion, right? Getting someone to your website is a conversion. You've started getting some data. Getting an email from someone is a conversion. Your data is getting more sophisticated. Getting their mobile more sophisticated yet again. Um, but then obviously the ultimate conversion is selling ticketing, you know, selling tickets and, and merchandise. And then the last piece, and again, not understated, is retaining those customers. You spend all this time going, to get, going and get them, don't let them go. And again, that's a spot that sports does really well. Get them in the, get them in the membership funnel and then keep them in there. I was lucky enough when Twitter uh, were looking to build out a, uh, an office in Australia, I uh, ran a Twitter brekkie in... Um, Melbourne and Sydney for the uh, sports and entertainment space. And I was lucky enough to have Will Anderson um, there at 7 o'clock at Etihad Stadium uh, talking about his experiences with Twitter and his experiences with digital overall. Um, and for mine, uh, his dig you know, someone asked him what his digital strategy was. And, uh, and he said, oh, well, I don't have a digital strategy. I just tell dick jokes on Twitter. But then he actually started to, to refine it and he said, look, I don't care that I have 250,000 Twitter followers. I just want 50,000 people every year to pay 50 bucks and go to a comedy show, right? It's really simple, right? And that's exactly the same whether it's, uh, whether it's Collingwood or Will Anderson, Will Anderson. It's about building out that audience and then engaging them with enough content and, and keeping them entertained so when you put out that call to action, um, they, they buy the ticket. They, you know, you commercialise... You commercialise that asset. So from a uh, getting started point of view, um, understand your content and have a think about who that content is for. Don't just put out the content for content's sake. Always be thinking when you're going to write something, post something, create something, who is it for? What action do I want them to take? Um, then it is all about cheeks in the seats. So how can you get that content to be driving people into your, into your productions, into your plays, into your theatres. And it's about embracing and amplifying your digital cheer squad. They're there, like they're already, you know, they're tweeting or they're posting or they're Instagramming. Um, you know, look to identify them and keep feeding them the content they need. I know I've run a little bit long, um, but if you, I'm more than happy to take some, uh, take some questions. If you want a copy of this presentation, you can text M Summit to that mobile number because it's another way to get data, right? You can text that number and you will have it by lunchtime. But if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them or take them at, uh, at, at lunchtime. Yes? We've got mics. Hang... James is just coming with a mic. How come the Facebook analytics never match up with anything else? It never matches up with the Bitly. It doesn't match up with Google Analytics or anything like that. Facebook says, you had 4,000 people look at this, whereas all the anal other analytics say 25. So that's back to the thing that they don't play nice together um, in getting you know, Facebook and Google and, and Bitly to match. Um, without... Uh, I don't, I, for mine, I don't sweat everything that Facebook's putting out from a stats point of view, because that's not their business. Like, that, that's not their main focus, their main focus at the moment. And from the ads point of view, I'm seeing, you know, better analytics on that side of things. Um, but I always go to multiple sources to, to find out, you know, what is working. So, it's not the best, like, I'm not the, I'm not the engineer behind the scenes, but, you know, Facebook analytics is always like a couple of days behind. If it's, if it's a glitch, you know, and it looks completely out of whack, I just go back into my former geek role and go, they're obviously working on it, it'll come back later. Um, but I wouldn't be sweating on every single one of those 
I would be sweating on the, the analytics that matter, so ticket sales, right? So, and, and then using Facebook and Google and Bitly to go, what is working in that space? Any other questions? No? Oh, okay. I've got a thousand questions, but I might, oh, yep, nope, we've got one right at the back. There. There's a mic behind you. Hi there, my name's Catherine. Um, I just wanted to know, like, we have lists upon lists upon lists for e-news, for donors, for yep. all that kind of stuff. Can those lists be integrated into...? Yes. Yeah, cool. So you can take all of those lists um, and go to the custom audiences piece, and, and I would load, you can load them all into one list if you want, but I would load them up separately so you could see that your donor list is a different demographic profile to your newsletter list, to your ticketing list, um, just from that information point of view. And then what you can do is go and create a saved audience where you can say, Facebook, I want to, I want to see what my audience looks like with my e-news, my donors, and just put them all into one big bucket. Um, and then you can analyze that as an audience. And can they then all, like when you update them, can they all talk to each other or? You can, you can be refresh, yeah, you, you can refresh them. So if you get a you know, new ticketing, so normally from a sports point of view, and I'll use this as the analogy, um, they will have last year's members, last year's ticketing data, this year's members, this year's ticketing data, um, and then maybe a, a secondary run. But then you, with all of that info, you can do, oh, I want to run an ad to, to get people to renew now. I want to exclude my current members and I want my new members to find out that kind of thing. So if you're doing a special offer for a ticketing deal and you don't want your, you know, your paying patrons that are already loaded up, you need those audiences in there separately so you can do the exclusion and things like that. At the front. Just do you want oh, mine? No, nope, here comes Gerard. Oh, no. Nope. Um, if the edge rank kind of numbers are changing, or the, the, the particular kind of data that Facebook is interested in, video, links, maybe next year it's VR or whatever it is, if that keeps changing, how do you recommend your clients tool up for that? Do they resource that internally? Do they get agencies to come in and create video content for them? How do you make that happen quickly? Um, that's a really good question about resourcing. Um, and it's a problem that's you know not unique to the arts, it's been an issue for sports. Um, I think the thing with, with social and the disposable nature, especially of video, that the high, apologies to the video guys doing a terrific job, the high value production that's, re that's right is lowering. Like, you know, this device can record pretty good quality content. Um, so, you, ca you know, you can, and there is a bit of get started. Um, I always prefer in-house to, to external and agencies, just from a, hey, we're trying to save money, um, and I say that as an agency, because <laughs> um, no one can tell your story better than you. Um, but there's, there's value potentially if you're looking at you know, marketing a, a production, you go, well, I want to do a tra trailer, a teaser, that kind of thing, and that's where you would potentially put the m money behind. But the, hey, we're doing a Facebook Live video, we're talking to the director on the night of the premiere for 30 minutes or 20 minutes, that can be done with the phone right there and then. So it's a bit of testing, testing that space to see what works. But if it's new, and you're right, you know, I know there's going to be talk about VR. You know, the other thing that Facebook owns is Oculus Rift. You know, they've gone and handed out these specs for a 360 degree camera, and they've let anyone do it. Like, they're the things that are going to be available. Um, I recently bought a, a 360 degree streaming uh, 4K camera for $1,800. I'm getting it in July, apparently. And literally, you just plonk it down, plug in the cable, and you've got a 360 degree camera streaming. So the ability, you know, it's going to be like the GoPro of 360. So the ability to do that will, be, will drop in price. You know, I know by December, I'll, I'll have done my money and they'll be far cheaper. But the, the ability for people to do that and create that content will get cheaper and cheaper. In the same way that GoPro has done in the action sort of space, I think there'll be more and more devices in that space that'll make it easier. Okay, there's one question at the back. I think yep. it's Ian. Um, from our organisation's perspective, Twitter is dead. Um, 
our Facebook audience has been growing faster than ever before, but our Twitter audience is completely static. Is that something that is being reflected across the spectrum, or is it just us? It's the reason it wasn't in the slides. <laughs> um, and I love Twitter. Um, uh, you know, from 20, 2009 to 2012, um, it had a lot of growth. It just hasn't got traction here. Um, you know, there's a reason Twitter don't tell you how many people have got Twitter. They're embarrassed. <laughs> um, so Instagram has surpassed Twitter as far as, you know, engagement and things like that. Um, and their ad product, like, you know, I'm more than happy to dive into an ad product, um, is not sophisticated enough. It doesn't have enough data. I can't target for a geographic, that kind of thing. Whereas the ad product that Facebook has, which is also available in Instagram, um, you know, it allows you to do that targeting, right? What everything that Facebook is now offering with both of those platforms allows you to get around influencers. Like if you've got someone that's an influencer in your space, you don't need to go and ask them to do something. You just advertise to their followers. Um, so my question with Twitter is always, what's the return on effort? Like it's a lot of tweeting and effort to be there. So it's more of a customer service uh, channel. There are some good techniques and hacks that you can do. Um, so again, like if you're using ift, um, I've set up an ift rule that anyone who tweets the msummit16 hashtag today, they get added on a list on my account. So if you've tweeted so far today, you've already been added on a list. So it's really good in that, you know, you can use it in that sense. But if you're asking me how much effort, is, you know, just enough is probably my answer. Is there another question or is it? No, I think that might be, oh, is it? You come and see me at lunch. But oh, yeah, I, there's my, there's oh, my, we've got one more. Yeah, right? we can take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. That's a good microphone come behind on. you. Um, I just wanted to confirm that you can actually find, with videos on Facebook, if you can actually find where, which people have viewed it to completion. Because I've never seen that. I don't know where. Yeah, so it's in the, it's in the ads. It's in the ad product. Mm -hmm. So you will do a video views campaign. So again, if we use the Harry Potter example. Oh, they can so it's only if it's an ad. So yeah. it, not if it's a not yeah. paid for. Okay. But that's the thing. You can put a tiny bit of money behind it mm -hmm. and it will give you two audiences. People who saw, who saw it. And you know, one thing to note, Facebook counts a view as three seconds, right? YouTube yeah. counts a view as 29 <laughs> seconds. Right, so there's a bit of stats, you know, stats are helpful, but sometimes stats are misleading. But at least tells you they, they saw it as they flew by, and then they give you a completed audience. And that's where the video length comes, kicks in. Um, but again, if you've got a, an, a, a data pool to target, and you said, I want people who visit my website, people who are in my database to see that video, you'll naturally get that, that, that value really cheap, because it'll be really relevant to that group. And then the bonus is, because they're an engaged group, they're most likely going to tag a friend or share it or say, hey, we want to, who wants to go to this? And that's, then you get all the free love. And all of those people, both the paid and organic, end up in that audience. Cool. OK, thank you.